Hey guys, welcome to the Bay Church. We're so thankful you decided to tune in online for our experience this weekend. And you know, we actually have some people that would love to be able to chat and engage with you online. So if you have any questions, you just feel like stopping by and saying hello, feel free to utilize that chat feature. We really want you to be active participants in today's experience. Mm -hmm. So if you hear something in service that you're all about, you love it, go ahead and say amen. Drop us those hearts, drop any of the praise emojis, anything else. Feel free to engage uh, and be an active participant. And one of the best ways to do that is actually to invite your friends and family to join you. Yeah. So if you have some friends and family you know are not online right now, go ahead and shoot them this link. Uh, you can send it via text, give them a call, make sure that they're included and a part. Yeah, and we yeah. also wanna know where you're watching from. So yes. right now, in the chat, let us know where you're watching from. Are you from the Yacht City like, like we us? are? That's right, yep. <laughs> Yacht Town, I don't know. Antioch. Yeah. There's people watching from all over the world and we love seeing that. So definitely make sure that you comment where you're viewing from. Yeah, and if it's your very first time watching, first of all, hello and welcome to the Bay family. We're so mm -hmm. glad you're with us. If you do me a favor though, we wanna connect with you personally and send you a little gift. Yeah. There's a welcome button in the top right hand corner. Click on that, fill out the card for us so we can get to know who you are. If you're watching on your phone or tablet, there's three lines uh, to your left. That's your menu button. Click on that and you'll see our welcome card uh, there as well. Yeah. You know, we're really looking forward to service today. We're actually jumping right back into our series on the 10 contentments. And Pastor John has a really great message for us on letting God meet our needs. And so I encourage you guys, uh, it's going to be it's gonna be good. I'm ready to receive that word. Yeah. And uh, parents, don't worry. We didn't forget about your kids. Yes. In fact, <laughs> normally you'd see me with like a full on beard. It's gone. All for the kids. All We've for been the married kids. like six years, guys, almost. Yeah. And first time she's probably seen this part of my face. <laughs> um, for the kids. Yeah. But uh, each and every week we have a uh, service for your kids tailored mm -hmm. specifically to them, um, sharing stories that they're going to fall in love with. So make sure you get them to check that out by clicking on the kids button in the top right hand mm -hmm. corner. Or once again, click on that menu button, the three lines, and you'll find it there. Yeah. Well, I. You know, I have to say, I feel like every couple of days, I'll have a wave of emotion just rush over me and I just turn to Kevin and I go, I miss people. I don't know if you guys are in the same boat with really just missing people in the season that we're in, but I am so thankful that God has created us for community. He's called us to live life together, to not do it alone. And I'm thrilled to tell you that one of the things that we're actually launching is online Zoom groups. Mm -hmm. So if you're like me and you're, you've been missing people, maybe you're normally not a super big people person, but you've realized the value of that in this season, we encourage you to sign up and join an online Zoom small group. You can do that simply by texting online to 925 892-3466 and you'll be able to sign up for the groups that way and maybe this is the first time you're hearing about zoom groups and you're like oh it'd be cool to lead one I, I never thought of that I have friends and family I can invite well that's great because we would love for you to be able to host a group and to do that all you have to do is text host to that same number so host to 925 892-3466 and we'll actually send you a link with some great resources to help you be able to really lead that group well. Yeah, and if you have any other questions or want any more information, really easy, just go to the bay.church forward yeah. slash events and you can find out more about our Zoom groups there. Uh, we're gonna jump into some worship together. Let's so let's get, get up ready. on our feet and get ready. Yeah. falling when fear is coming still you're calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted you will be my strength when my mind says i'm not good enough god you're enough for me i've decided
witnesses to me Whoa, now there's no stopping What you have started Until it is complete When my mind says I'm not good enough God, you're enough for me Yes, I decided I'm not giving up You won't give up on me
As we continue our worship through giving, I want to encourage you with this uh, verse from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. It says this, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's good. You know, I, I feel like God um, specifically puts different verses like that in Scripture for us worriers out there. I don't know if any of you struggle with worry, but uh, <laughs> I definitely struggle with worry a little bit more than, than Kevin does. And um, I, I'm so encouraged by the fact that we serve a God that not only sees our needs, but mm -hmm. He truly does provide and meet for our needs. Amen. And we've been talking a lot about um, just the season that we all find ourselves in. And if we're being honest, there's abundant need in our community. Um, I don't know maybe what your story is, what your situation is that you're going through right now, but maybe you are homeschooling kids and you need a break. <laughs> maybe there is something physically going on in your body and you, you need God to help out in that area, or maybe you're really needing God's provision. Um, I'm reminded in this season for myself of God's faithfulness mm -hmm. and for what He has done in my life, especially in those seasons of worry and those seasons of unknown situations and circumstances. And you know, the time that I am reminded the most of actually is 2009. Um, some of you, 2009 may have been a great year, but for myself, it actually was a really trying year. There was a lot of struggle, um, a lot of worry, a lot of uncertainty, but also a lot of growth, but not without the growing pains. The beginning of 2009, it was actually my senior year uh, of high school and my dad lost his job. And he immediately had to move out of state because that was the only place that he could find employment. This was kind of the beginning of the economic downturn that happened then. And I knew that God had called me to stay in my community, intern for my local church and start college. And so after I graduated, I decided I would do that. The rest of my family left and I was renting out a um, house with some some friends and my very first day of officially being on my own as an adult I go to my local grocery store where I was working at the time clocked in and got ready to be at my cashier stand and all of a sudden my name gets shared over the loudspeaker um, asking me to come up to the manager's office and unfortunately I ended up getting laid off that day very first day as an adult very first day being on my own and I held it together only until I made it to the car where I then proceeded to cry and cry out to God and really was devastated in that moment. And there was so much fear and uncertainty that raised up in my heart at that moment. And God in an instant helped to really silence all of those voices by impressing this one question on my heart and it was, Asanda, do you believe that I am who I say that I am and that I will do what I've promised you I'm going mm -hmm. to do? And in that moment, I had to just take a deep breath and, and let it go and say, yes, God, yes, I trust that you are who you say that you are. Yes, I trust that you will continue to meet my needs. And as I walked out in obedience and was continuing to be faithful with my finances with him, Guys, he not only provided immediately, the next day I was able to work for a previous employer, but that whole situation ended up leading to what at the time was my dream job, working at a local coffee shop as a barista. And there was struggle, there was a lot of uncertainty, but I'm so thankful that I didn't sit in that worry and in that fear, sit in, almost immobilized but instead chose to put my trust and yeah. my faith that God is who he says that he is and he will meet our needs. Yeah, and, and, so, and, that's, yeah. and that's the best part about God is that's really all he asks us to do is mm -hmm. to trust him and to trust him in everything yeah. that we have. And when we do that, we can also worship him in everything mm -hmm. we, that we have, including our giving. Because when we give back to God, we're just giving him a small portion mm -hmm. of what he's already poured out over and over in our lives, abundantly even. Yes. And so we're gonna take some time right now um, to be able to do that, to worship Him mm -hmm. through our giving. Yeah, and as we prepare to give, there's actually three ways that you can give today. The first is through text to give. The second is by clicking that giving button that you see on the screen. And the third way is actually mailing in your giving. And that can be done by click, by going to the notes section and mailing in to the address that you see there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's pray together. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you so much for uh, the fact that you are faithful through it all. Mm -hmm. Even in these uncertain times, you are 
faithful to us, God. And I thank you that we have this moment to be able to worship you through our giving. Yeah. Uh, God, that uh, even in uncertain times that when we give to you, God, you show up even bigger mm -hmm. uh, in our lives, God. And as we go into this message about letting you take care of all of our needs, mm -hmm. God, that uh, we would hear from you. We'd find a spot in our life right now where we can find a way to give back um, and, and to see you work abundantly in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, honestly, a Sunday could have got wrapped up in those bad things that were going on there and we missed can, out. Right? Yeah, and missed yeah. out on the great things that God's done. And so we want to do that now. We want to give back to God and we want to worship Him and remember the great things that He's doing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that right now uh, by going into another worship song called Nothing Else. Yeah. Uh, and remember this, that nothing else matters. Amen. The only thing that matters is God. Amen.
just want you. Nothing else. Just need you. Nothing else. Nothing else is real to me. I just want you. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you for sharing your weekend with us uh, at the Bay Church this weekend. We love to have you be part of the family and part of our community as we continue growing these days. Uh, I want to tell you, boy, oh boy, do I ever miss you, and I can't wait till sometime in the future when I can give you a big old bear hug again. I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, this weekend, we continue our series in the Ten Contentments which you may know more commonly as the Ten Commandments. And we are already at number eight. And it is simply uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, these four words, you shall not steal. Just those four simple words. What is stealing? What is theft from God's perspective? What's the broader application of these four words as an everyday principle in our lives? So what we're going to talk about this weekend is learning how to let God meet your needs, because that's at the jugular of this eighth commandment. Now, before we dive into Bible study this weekend, I want to say a couple things uh, real quickly, if I may. First of all, every May, for Carrie and I marks our anniversary as your pastor. And I want to tell you, for John and Carrie, this has quite simply been uh, the greatest privilege of our lives. And we mean that sincerely with all of our hearts. It has been a privilege to serve you and your families and to love you. And uh, these nine years that we've now completed, we now begin year number 10 together, and I can't wait. And I simply want you to hear it from me. Thank you for the privilege of being part of your life. Second thing I want to say, you may be familiar that we had to cancel our Israel trip this past March uh, because of pandemic, and we have rescheduled it, and you are invited. Come join Carrie and myself as we go to Israel February of 2021. The dates are February 1 through 15, and I promise you that this journey to the Holy Land, Israel, the land of the Bible, is a game changer. You will simply be forever changed. If you're interested, all you need to do is shoot me an email that says, hey, John, uh, count us in. We would love to go. What do we need to do? What are next steps? So just simply write me at johnatthebay.church, and our team will get back to you right away, okay? Love to include you. So having said that, let's dive into our Bible study uh, this weekend. And what we have been doing uh, through the whole course of these contentments is taking a brief moment at the, at the beginning of each one of them and reading them together. I think that's a, a healthy practice. Let's do that right now. You see them before you. Uh, let's read them slowly and focus on the eighth one because that's our focal point this weekend, right? Let's read them together. Begin. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Okay, those are the four vertical commandments or the four life-giving principles that have to do all about our relationship with God. And now we move to the horizontal plane, our relationship with each other and how we care for each other and how we treat one another. So let's pick up the trail at verse number five. Here we go. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And then finally, you shall not covet. Now, you may remember that with the first four commandments being about a relationship with God, these final six commandments being about our relationship with each other, I'm not sure that there's a commandment that has more to say about how we treat one another and how we care for one another than the principle that we're wrestling with this weekend. 
Now, to that end, uh, there is an author that I've enjoyed for a bunch of years. His name is Robert Fulgham. He wrote a book a bunch of years ago called Everything That You'll Ever Need to Know About Life, You'll Learn in Kindergarten. Listen to these insights and think back to when you were four, five, six years old in kindergarten. They're very simple. Not easy, but simple. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. That's this weekend, right? Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Boy, have we learned that lately through this pandemic, right? And we, not only before we eat, but every other time as well. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are very good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw some and paint some and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. These are the things that everything we need to know about life we learned in kindergarten and we're focusing on that one that is this, don't take things that aren't yours. Now we're dividing our Bible study this weekend into three simple parts and the first is let's try to get our arms around the life-giving principle. What is the essence of what God is saying in these four profound words in this eighth contentment? The heart of this principle is to honor the ownership of others. That's really what's happening here. Learn to honor the ownership of others. And if we'll keep our hearts right, then our actions will be right. And so the first of these four principles that will help us understand how to honor the ownership of others is to, first of all, learn contentment. Make note of that. Learn contentment. Enough will never be enough if we don't learn contentment. Being satisfied with what we have. More is not the answer. Newer, better, shinier, uh, more in demand. That's not going to make us a happier, better human being. Learn contentment. There's a second principle that goes with it, and it's this. Learn that ultimately God is our provider. It's true. Ultimately, God is our provider. And what the Father is saying to us in this eighth commandment is, don't steal because you don't need to because I am your provider. That's what's going on here in this eighth commandment. God is saying, let me meet all of your needs. Trust me to be your provider. By the way, many years ago, for those of you that feel like you might be in ministry one day in the local church or as a missionary or something like that, I have learned for those that are in full-time ministry as their God call, that ultimately there are no goods in this world that bring full compensation for ministry, but the Bible says going all the way back to the Old Testament that in ministry, the Lord is our inheritance. The Lord is our portion. The Lord is our payback when we give our life to his work. That is so much better than houses and land and monies and bank accounts. The Lord is our inheritance. So I want to bring balance to this in talking about God being our provider, and it's this. Don't think that God's going to do it all for us and we just sit around and chill. No, no. We have to work hard. We have to not do stupid stuff with the money we earn and then watch God be our provider in life. Because I just think that someday you and I will be wandering down the winding golden path in the heavenly hills and we will suddenly realize, you and I, how obsessed we were with the meaningless, trivial, material things during our brief stay on this planet. 
What are we talking about here? We're talking about the life-giving principle of learning contentment, of learning that God is our provider. And then number three, observe it. It's interesting to note that this eighth commandment is the only the command that deals exclusively with property. Did you know that? Um, if you think about civil law in the nations these days, at the present moment, generally, there are far more laws protecting property on the statute books, laws protecting property than laws protecting life. Think about that. Sadly, we humans can become disoriented and we begin to use people and love things. And the father says, my child, I love you so much, you'll never be happy if you allow your life to drift in that way. It's all about using things and loving people. Listen to the wisdom of the word. Proverbs 15, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Proverbs 19, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Proverbs 23, do not wear yourself out getting rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint because you cast but a glance at riches and poof, they are gone. Proverbs 30, God give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Now notice what he wraps with. Otherwise I may have too much and disown the Lord and say, who is God? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. In Matthew 6, therefore I tell you, says Jesus, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, drink, your body, what you'll wear. Life is so much more important than food. The body's so much more important than clothing. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you and I as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation, into a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires, and they will be led into the place of ruin and destruction. Because some people, Paul concludes in 1 Timothy 6, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then Hebrews chapter 13, keep your lives free from the love of stuff and money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, says the Lord. That passage goes on to add, this is a footnote, that godliness with contentment is great gain. And then there is a fourth principle here as we try to understand the life-giving principle, and it's this. Matter or the material can never satisfy the spiritual, which is to say can never deeply and fully satisfy the human soul. Stuff, the temporal goods of this world, it seduces us with promises it cannot fulfill. Only relationship with God and relationship with people can satisfy the deepest longing of the human spirit. I remember when I uh, began to learn this, and it just makes me laugh. And if my wife were here in the moment, she'd be laughing too. Uh, I came to Christ at 16. And at 22, I married a really fabulous lady, and we begin our lives together. This is 1982, and we had our first apartment together in Tacoma, Washington. And we began to live together as husband and wife, and there was such beauty and joy in the simple things. Uh, I won't go through a whole description, but our first Apartment. I can still remember them. Park 19 apartments. Oh, yes. There was a beat up beanbag couch. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, it was ugly. There was a leftover psychedelic hippie bedspread from the 70s. We slept under that for the first few years. Truthfully, it was even uglier. 
We had TV trays for end tables, a garage sale battered, scarred up dining room table for two from somebody's garage. Our, our transportation was Buster. Buster was an old baby blue Volkswagen bug that spit out smoke and putted and huffed and puffed as we went along uh, the hills of the Puget Sound. We didn't have a lot of stuff, but let me tell you what we did have. We had love, we had each other, we had God, and we still do. All that other stuff, it's just poof, gone. And the things that matter most remain to this day. Friends, we need to hear the beating heart of this eighth contentment. Because what God is saying in do not steal, uh, sin in this context is, if we do steal, God says, I don't want you to steal. I don't want you to sin. And the essence of I don't want you to sin is, I don't want you to hurt yourself. Because ultimately, if we do steal, we will be found out. We will be caught. There will be consequence. We might even destroy our own lives and the great potential that our lives hold. And so my encouragement is that you and I learn contentment, learn the true value of all things, right? Trust God to be our provider and know that stuff will never ever in a thousand lifetimes make us ultimately happy. Let's move to our second big portion of our Bible study this weekend and talk about three ways that we come into possession of anything. And it's really uh, very simple. First of all, uh, we can be the receiver of a gift. In other words, a free gift from another person that's given in love or maybe inheritance. So it's a gift. We are given something which we did not merit, which we did not earn by the sweat of our brow. It's a gift, and with humble gratitude, we receive it. That's a legitimate way to come into possession of things. Secondly is work. The Bible teaches about the beauty of daily labor, that toil uh, by the sweat of our brow daily brings to us a sum of money for our labor. And do you know what's really happening here when we're paid for our work? Uh, Money is really only in exchange for a part of our lives called T-I-M-E, time. The Bible teaches that daily honorable labor that is aligned with our passions, our gifts, the entrustments with which God has entrusted us can and should be deeply rewarding. So we can come into possession through gifts, secondly, through work, or thirdly, through theft, through stealing, taking from another that which does not belong to us, that which we have not legitimately earned. And so in a very real sense, all property that's not been attained by working or by gift in some sense, is stolen property. Okay, let's move into our third uh, portion of our Bible study this weekend, and let's talk about 10 ways that we steal. Now, I want you to hear my heart on this uh, briefly before we dive quickly into these 10 ways. Uh, This list is not about keeping score on each other, or I notice that you've done me wrong. Because ultimately, we cannot know the heart of another human being, their true motivation. What this list is about is understanding in a broader concept how God thinks about theft in all areas of our life. Because this is not just about robbing a bank. We can have drifted into embedded assumptions that have led to deeply embedded daily lifestyle behaviors that in a very real sense are theft. So really these moments are about you and I searching our heart to really fully understand what theft is from God's point of view and then to make any necessary adjustments, okay? 
Well, of these 10 ways, note this first one, it is fraud. Now, you're probably familiar with the word fraud, but let me just give you a brief working definition. Fraud is deceit. It is trickery. It is cheating. In our culture today, we have this just a little bit syndrome. And I want you to know in our biblical verse today, God is not saying you shall not steal a lot, but a little bit that's okay, I'll give you a free pass. God is saying, my child, if you want to be my fully devoted follower, if you want your character to align with my holy character, my child, I don't want you to steal at all. Let me give you an example. Um, I sort of love early Americana of many different epics in history. Uh, And one of my favorite uh, artists is a guy named Norman Rockwell. Uh, Norman Rockwell had many uh, famous paintings, which are still really popular throughout the world today. And in one of them, his most famous paintings is a Thanksgiving painting, which appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. And in this painting, there are two people. There was a, a portly, friendly butcher and a sweet little old lady And in Rockwell's picture, both the butcher and the little old lady are looking at the same time at a big old turkey on a scale. This turkey is obviously being weighed so she could purchase it, pay the necessary amount of money and take it home and her family could enjoy Thanksgiving. And they are looking at this turkey together and they are both smiling, not noticing what the other one is doing. Because at the same time, the butcher was pushing down with his thumb on the scale to make the turkey weigh more so he'd get more money for the bird, while the sweet little old lady had her finger under the scale, pushing up, smiling so sweetly. And each was unaware of the deception of the other. I love that picture because that's fraud. God wants us to be concerned with how our behavior affects other human beings. Remember, this eighth contentment is in those six commandments about how we care for one another, about how we treat one another. When we rip one another off, our gain to another's disadvantage is not pleasing to God. What are some of the examples of stealing with fraud? Well... How about this one? Borrowing and forgetting to return. Has that ever happened to you? How about accepting unemployment or welfare checks when in fact we can work? How about not fully paying all of our taxes? So the encouragement is this, take legitimate deductions, but let's not lie. By saying things like, oh, we'll never be audited, which is to say, we'll never be caught. Friends, if we're going to cultivate a heart free of theft, that is not the point that we won't be caught. The point is that God, who is holy, who is loving, who is good, who is our provider and our father, the point is that he knows. I don't know if you have seen those videos taken of people Uh, They appear on different shows and media and so forth, uh, taken of people who have filed fraudulent insurance claims, say, for example, disability for a bad back. By the way, fraud in American culture is epidemic. It is costing the American taxpayer and American business billions of dollars every year because somebody is pushing down on the scale and somebody else is pushing up on the scale. So anyhow, these videos of a disability for a bad vat back, people are busted because they are hauling or lifting very heavy objects, working away, doing physical labor, obviously with no pain. What's really happening here is that are we taking advantage of the system? We say, well, no one is going to miss a few thousand bucks. Those insurance companies, they have so much money. They're always trying to rip you off. That is not the point. The point is father knows. And we want to cultivate a heart 
which is deeply pleasing and honoring to him. It seems the way that we've revised this eighth contentment in our culture today might actually read, instead of you shall not steal, it might actually read the way we've reworked it, you shall not get caught. That's not what the contentment says. Let's go to number two. Another example is gambling. You know that gambling also in American culture is epidemic. It's all-consuming, and frankly, it's tragic. I've been a shepherd of souls long enough to know this and tried to help enough people who have wrecked their lives through this addictive behavior. And people today are gambling on everything from sports and cards and online games and slot machines and lottery and horses and poker and everything else. And in some sense, if you think about, if you boil down and distill what's really going on, in some way we're trying to legitimize greed. In some way it's sort of a tax on covetousness. And I would say to us, it's a destructive habit. It is addictive. It does ruin lives and families. Avoid it. You shall not steal in spirit. Clearly includes this kind of an idea. Here's the third. Failure to pay debts. Now, friends, let me say to you honestly, and I'm speaking in all these sort of 10 ways that we might unintentionally steal. I'm talking to myself first before I talk to anybody else. So we're growing and learning together, right? If we are not paying our bills on time, in fact, we are stealing. You say, well, John, I simply can't keep up with the bills. Then I would say to you, why did we buy it in the first place? And I, I want to be gentle here. I want to be kind and encouraging. This is not about fault finding. Americans have allowed their material world and their ability to sort of live on plastic to spin out of control. And Maybe you might need plastic surgery, as it were, and to begin to get your financial house in order. And if you're in a place where you're stressed, you're not sleeping well at night, creditors are knocking on the doors of your life, you, you can't extract yourself uh, immediately. It takes time to do the right thing. But in six months, 12 months, a year and a half, a couple years, can we not, with God's help and biblical wisdom, begin to bring our financial house in order? I want to encourage you to take our very popular class here at the Bay Church called Financial Peace. It will simply help you a lot. So, so much of the prosperity of our day is a leveraged prosperity of acquisition. It's a plastic prosperity, a debt prosperity. Do you know that in just a generation or two, we have gone in the United States of America from being the world's largest lender nation to now being the world's largest debtor nation? How has that happened? We've drifted in this principle. There's a fourth thing we might want to think about, and that is we could steal from our employer. You say, John, what does theft look like? I don't even know the bank or the safe combination. I'm not getting in and, or, or the passwords and, you know, plummeting somebody else's assets. No, no. But we can arrive at work late. That's stealing. We can have half-hearted effort or a bad attitude or take longer breaks than allowed or uh, accidentally take home company property, be careless with company resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We get the idea. What is this about? It's about searching our heart. The scripture says, Search me, O God, and know me, and see if there be any way in me that's not pleasing to you, and lead me in the way everlasting. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, the Bible says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work. There is a fifth way that we can steal, and the Bible is abundantly clear on this, and it's stealing from God. You say, John, how could we possibly steal from God? The Bible calls it the tithe. God says, you've robbed me, my children, and the tithe, because the Bible clearly teaches in Old Testament and in New that if we're not worshiping God with our tithe, then we are in some sense stealing from him. Not my words. 
the words of Holy Scripture. I can tell you what I've learned as a child from a single parent home. I can tell you that I've been way better off with 90% with God's blessing in my life than with 100% and I'm all on my own. Listen to the words of the prophet Malachi in chapter three. It's God speaking actually. And it begins, will a man or woman rob God? Yes, you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you? Answer, in tithes and in offerings. So you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. So bring the whole tithe, the whole tithe, not a tip, the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Think on these things. Number six, did you know that there is something called theft of reputation, and we do that by gossip and by slander. Do you know that the Bible tells us that on that day when we stand before him, we'll have to give an accounting for each of our words? The Bible says we don't just randomly think words, but whatever comes out of our mouths originated in our hearts. So we can say hurtful things, damaging things, slanderous things, gossiping and destructive things, and say later if we're caught or called on it, no, no, I didn't mean that. Actually, we did mean that. And it's eating us up inside, and now we are stealing somebody else's reputation. This is what I can tell you about, for example, the local church. There are not just church people, people that have uh, an, an active relationship with Christ and are part of his community, and the unchurched people that have never known Christ, but there are, in American culture, millions of de-churched, de-churched. Women and men who used to go to church once upon a time, and then they were so badly damaged, so badly wounded and scarred by gossiping tongues that they had to leave and just get away from it. And here's the thing that just grieves my heart as a human being, as a child of God. Not only have they shut the church out of their lives, they'll shut God out of their lives. Because you and I are the only Bible other people will ever read. We are supposed to, the idea of Christian is to be a little Christ, a little Jesus. So ask ourselves the question, how many people are not in church today because of things that we may have said. I think probably the delivery vehicle of the most slander in our culture today, and we are regularly helping people try to recover, try to safeguard their lives, try to find a safe place to get away, is slander on social media. Talk about theft of reputation. Some of the things posted are a toxic cesspool, and I encourage you, to let our minds and our hearts and our tongues be sweet and good and edifying and empowering and uplifting and inspiring to other people. Here's a seventh thing to be mindful of, theft of person. You say, John, what does the Bible even mean that there's theft of person? Well, it's one of the commandments, the sixth commandment, where God speaks very seriously about the taking of innocent human lives, i.e. abortion. The Bible clearly says that that little girl or boy in the womb was created by God, and from the moment of conception is a human being created in God's image. How about in our history? the evil sin historically of slavery, the taking of innocent lives, the injustice that's deeply embedded in so many quarters of American culture. Are we not taking the lives of our fellow human being? Uh, in some sense, I ask God to forgive our nation of our many sins in this regard because truly we have innocent blood on our hands. I would encourage you to check out Proverbs 
chapter 24. Number eight, theft of purity. We talked about this for some weeks as we talked about safeguarding the most important relationship of all, marriage. And we talked about not committing adultery. In other words, keeping our promises to our mate. And I had Ray and Erica Menchaca and Warnell and Talia Brooks help me in that regard. God created the beautiful gift of sexuality for marriage. He further said, it is very good. And he said, therefore, I don't want you to drift into adultery. I do not want you to commit fornication because in doing that, you not only rob your own virtue, you rob the virtue and purity of another. This may stun you, but so many American teenagers lose their virginity in the afternoons between 3.30 and 5.30 after school in their own homes while their parents are gone. Think about that. Number nine, theft of faith. Let me just read to you Luke chapter 17. You may want to check this out later. It's verses one and two. Theft of faith. What does it mean to steal another's faith? Jesus said this. Woe to anyone that causes people to stumble in me. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of my little ones to stumble. No matter woman's an island, what I do, my behavior affects you. Your behavior affects me. And the most vulnerable of all, the innocent, those that are just beginning their relationship with Christ, people that do not know God, that look at us to be a consistent, wholesome example of compassion and kindness, we can actually, in some sense, damage their capacity to ever think about beginning their relationship with God because they're so messed up in their head by the hypocrisy they may have seen in us. Finally, theft of enemy. You say, John, what is theft of enemy? Lawsuits. Lawsuits. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I won't take the time to read it, there's a significant portion of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about not suing one another. Uh, He speaks specifically in that context to people that are Christ followers, and he said, hey, you will be judging the nations on that day. Can you not settle your own trivial affairs of this earth? Why would you need to go and get an army of lawyers on both sides to be in a full attack mode? And by the way, in saying this, I'm not seeking in any way to uh, to be disparaging toward the honorable vocation of being an attorney in any context. I'm simply saying it's about searching our heart because the only legitimate way, we've established this earlier in this message, that we can own anything is by work, or by gift, and suing each other is neither. And we are a litigation-happy nation these days, and often our motivation is revenge or greed. And the father says, my child, I don't want your heart to work that way. So, now these four words, you shall not steal. God is really saying, let me be your provider. Remember that stuff ultimately cannot satisfy the deepest yearnings in your soul. Learn contentment. Do the right thing. Be good in your heart and our behaviors will be good. Realize gain through diligent, integrous labor that is willing to share results and and benefits with other people in need, particularly the widow and the orphan. But in all things, honor the Lord. I love you so much. I want you just wherever you are to bow your head right now. And I want to pray for you in closing. Just wherever you are, your living room, maybe your bedroom, a car someplace, some other kind of a setting. You might be alone. You might be with another person, a two, or maybe even a group. Just bow your heads right now. And as I begin to pray to close this teaching... If you want to receive Christ, 
begin your relationship with God this weekend, you can just click on the button on your screen that says, commit my life to Christ. Go ahead and do that now. And we have pastors that are ready to pray with you, talk with you, listen to you, be there to support you and walk through this momentous moment in your life, okay? So click on that button right now to commit your life to Christ as I wrap in prayer. Father God, I pray that you come into our life with amazing grace to wash all of our sins away. As we look, have looked at theft this weekend, Father God, uh, there are none of us exempt and, and in some ways we've allowed drift to occur. And, and God, I can certainly say that is true of my life. Search me, God, and know me. And if there's any way in me, which I know there is, that I need to make those adjustments, then I will do it. And would you help my friends as well? God, would you be glorified? I pray, Lord, that where people may be feeling guilt now, they are feeling the freedom and the peace brought by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we ask it in his name. And everyone said, amen. I can't wait to see you next weekend. Until then, have a great week. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed service and that you feel encouraged by that message. If you need any prayer today, simply type the word prayer in chat and we have people waiting to connect with you. Yeah, and you know, your next best step is actually gonna be signing up for Growth Track. If you've never done Growth Track before or if you're looking for a refresher, the month of May is the perfect time to do that because we're doing it all online and it can be completed at your own pace. To sign up for that, you just simply have to text the number on the screen. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you guys next time.